Okay, uh, so we're going to start uh, the final session of the day on the hat. And um, we've got uh, Dr. Sara Garbarino from the University of Genoa. Genoa, yes. Well, yeah, I'm not going to answer that. Very well. Um, and Sarah's going to be talking about mechanistic continuous progression modeling. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Pete. Thanks, Neil, Alex, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today uh, about mechanistic modeling of neurodegenerative diseases and kind of its interplay with disease progression modeling. Sorry about this uh, voice that comes and goes. Um, I can. I can only just call it now. Okay, otherwise I don't want to just call it. Okay. Okay, so uh um okay. I'm gonna use the arrows. Okay. Okay, so some preambles first, in which I kind of unsolicitedly justify myself on the choice I made regarding this presentation. So I will concentrate mostly on That's Alzheimer's it. disease. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah. I think we can hear Sarah pretty well. In the I can. So I'll turn the volume right down on this on this machine and unmute on this machine. Okay. And then you can just take it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, right. I was cleaning necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I can I can scream quite loudly. <laughs> so hopefully online you can all hear. Um, we'll do our best. Okay. So as I was saying, I will mostly concentrate on Alzheimer's disease. And within the plethora of different mechanisms that involve Alzheimer's disease, mostly on mechanisms of protein dynamics. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, the first being personal, as I actually have experience with um, quantitative mechanistic modeling and disease progression modeling of protein dynamics. The second is because there is a rich history in the field with numerous paper publications and model developments that happened in the last 10 years or so that kind of provided a solid set of experiences. And then because um, many dynamics of protein clearance, aggregation and propagation, despite involving different proteins in different disorders are actually shared amongst neurodegenerative disorders. So what we learn on protein dynamics in Alzheimer's disease will hopefully generalize to other neurodegenerative disorders. And then finally, I'm a mathematician. Uh, so I'm mainly interested in modeling and quantitative development rather than investigating the etiology of diseases per se. And this, um, this will reflect in the choice of the models that I, I will be showing you uh, today. Okay, this is a, an outline of we, what you will hear about in the next 40 minutes or so. So I will start with trying to give an introduction of what. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's if it's not problematic, for okay. I'm trying to mute it. <laughs> <laughs> bit too much, you say. <laughs> like, take it down a, bit, like a notch. <laughs> I'm not a, not a Windows user, so let's see if I can work out how to mute. But it's okay, um, if it's not disturbing for you. How's that? Um, can you still hear us online? Can you? Oops. Yep, thanks, Jake. That's the wrong thing. Okay, PowerPoint slides. Wait a second. I think we can see that I'm unmuted, so I don't know which one we want to mute. Um, there's a Pond 22 speaker that can be muted. You can mute Pond 22 because we're using my input now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll get rid of that. Sorry. Thanks. Take two. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I was saying just an overview of uh, what I will be talking to you in the next 40 minutes or so. So first we're gonna go through what is mechanistic modeling, what's the definition and what could be considered as the mechanistic modeling. Then we will have a bit of an overview of the main mechanisms that involve uh, Alzheimer's disease and what is our understanding of them. And then I will focus on protein dynamics, uh, mechanistic modeling in Alzheimer's disease for the reasons you heard earlier. 
And then I have collected my thoughts on strength and limitations of these types of model, and I'd be happy to have a discussion on what's still missing here. Okay, so yeah. So first thing first, I thought a bit about giving a definition of uh, mechanistic modeling that could be like, broad enough to encompass the different models and techniques that we will be here about today. So I think a good definition could be Mechanistic modeling is the practice of modeling the mechanisms leading to the development and escalation of neurodegenerative disorders. But in my opinion, it's not just building models, but building tractable models of them. So at the scale, essentially, with tractable, I mean something at the scale we can computationally work with, we can make prediction from, and from which we can infer the parameters that describe the mechanisms. And this is because I believe the aims of mechanistic modeling are, of course, enhancing our understanding of the mechanisms of neurodegenerative disorder, but also in silico outcome prediction. So I mean that if we can infer the parameters governing the mechanisms, then we can use the parameters to make outcome prediction, and in particular, treatment outcome prediction in simulation. Uh, and then refined multi-layer prediction staging. So I just, I already had a quick discussion with Neil on this point, who doesn't really agree with me on this. Uh, I agree that it's not the primary point of mechanistic modeling. Uh, still, I believe, but I'm open to discussion on that, that if we, like if mechanistic modeling can provide multi-layer understanding of diseases, so understanding of diseases, of diseases from different mechanistic point of view, vasculature, a protein dynamics, a metabolism, et cetera, this could, in combination with the disease progression model, also boost somehow precision staging. Okay, so this is a kind of list of the main mechanisms we will discuss today. Protein dynamics, we will keep it for later. Uh, and I will just start talking about uh, gene expression, which is often considered as selective vulnerability of specific neurons. We already had a talk uh, this, this morning that discussed these, uh, this topic. Um, I, I'm just gonna say that I think there are two main branches of literature here dealing with this selective vulnerability mechanistic topic. One is that um, on one side, we have studies that deal with RNA sequences, sequencing of specific regions from post-mortem brains. And on the other side, we have studies that deal with association analysis between patterns of vulnerable regions and patterns of brain connectivity somehow. So on the second item, uh, a couple of seminal papers on the context of finding association between vulnerable regions and brain connectivity patterns came out in the last, I think, 2009, 2012 from CLA's lab. And Although like neurodegenerative disorder had already been thought to target large scale neural networks, those papers were kind of the first to actually match uh, neurodegeneration induced vulnerability with patterns of intrinsic connectivity. And these papers essentially show that indeed intrinsic connectivity in health can predict regional vulnerability to disease in terms of neurodegeneration and that regions with high flow and short and that are like connectively closer to the most central regions are the regions that show greater disease related vulnerability. So the study links these two patterns of um, vulnerability from neuroimaging studies and brain connectivity patterns. Then a few years ago, we also uh, we investigated the impact of the progression on these types of uh, uh, connectivity related uh, patterns. And we, uh, yeah, we, we saw that um, by combining disease progression model, by factoring disease progression modeling into the game, you can actually gain more insight on these types of patterns. Um, then on the other hand, uh, we have selective vulnerability at uh, like gene level, uh, molecular level. Uh, we heard a bit uh, this morning about it. Uh, I'm not just not gonna go into details of that, um, but I will mention this recent paper, uh, which uh, came out last year, 
And essentially, um, the, the authors here, they trace the gene expression um, in post-mortem brains along the uh, tau pathology in Alzheimer's disease brains. In both entorhinal cortex and the superior frontal gyrus, which are regions that are typically involved in early and late stage tau pathologies. And they found that there was a subset of excitatory neurons, which expressed a specific transcription factor, that were the first to succumb, first in the entorhinal cortex and then in the superior frontal gyrus. And this somehow, like following the the, the, the progression of tau pathology. And this somehow provided a molecular characterization of the selectively, neuron, uh, selectively vulnerable neurons in Alzheimer's disease. I think it was a quite interesting paper on the topic. Um, okay, so uh, aging. Uh, so mechanistic models of aging, I would say are um, like fall within three main categories, I would say. One is um, generative model of the aging brain. Then we have models for brain connectivity changes in the aging brain. And then we have mechanistic models, models of oxidative stress. And for this first part of models, so generative model of the aging brain, I think the, one of the first paper was, um, came out about 10 years ago. And they argued that the aging brain development uh, could be described as a spatial temporal process which is actually accessible by MRI morphometry. And the authors provided a way to uh, like estimate trajectories of brain evolution from changes in neuroanatomical images of brain. Then uh, there was this paper from Cole and colleagues a few years ago that defined these uh, brain age biomarker. Uh, probably you're familiar with this, but the idea is that you can use a CNN-based model to develop uh, this brain age biomarker as, of, as opposed to the actual age. And then again, many, many papers added to the collection over the years, either including other imaging techniques to build a more comprehensive view of the model, like this paper, which uses one of the papers here that uses, um, um, all right, sorry, yeah, uses, um, yeah, uses, PET images and variational autoencoder as a statistical framework, or other papers, more recent papers that actually try to build these spatial temporal um, models without the use of longitudinal data. So we're using cross sectional data only. Um, models of brain connectivity changes are also quite popular, and they mainly uh, define age related disruption of brain's integrity and information flow across. Uh, uh, the brain as uh, in terms of differences in functional and structural connectivity using a variety of graph metrics. And then we have models of oxidative stress. So there was this paper uh, again here last year that like uh, provided, suggested a combined theory of aging in which essentially the idea would be something along the line that DNA damage uh, like induces elevates energy needs, which in turn increase oxygen consumption with which damage the mitochondrial and which uh, elevates the levels of free radicals and so on. So this kind of model could be, I think, an interesting starting point to start thinking about quantitative models of oxidative stress uh, in um, in, uh, in the brains. Okay, then we have metabol metabolism. So metabolic changes are prominent in AD. We know from uh, like evidence of glucose deficiencies, oxidative stress, lipid metabolism, etc. cetera. Um, there were these couple of papers again in the last years that I think uh, were, were interesting. It kind of described Alzheimer's disease as a metabolic disease. So discussing glucose consumption, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, lipid metabolism uh, uh, has a prominent uh, um, mechanism in Alzheimer's disease. The kind of, they were uh, review articles. They described many different models for the metabolic changes in Alzheimer's disease. I think two of the most interesting models uh, were the fact that there's evidence that uh, inefficient glucose consumption is related to oxidative stress 
and this somehow could suggest the existence of an interaction pathway between uh, oxidative stress and, uh, and glucose consumption. And there, a model for um, like the biochemical events associated to insulin binding, because insulin resistance is common in Alzheimer's disease. And so they provided this kind of biochemical model, which could again be a nice and interesting starting point for building quantitative mechanistic models of glucose uh, deficiency in NAD. And then there was this study, um, it's a bit old, it's from 2015. Uh, but again, it's, it's quite interesting. It's a study that discusses the uh, mechanistic insight on Alzheimer's disease from uh, studies on Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome. And that's because there are, uh, you know, several proteins that are associated with uh, amyloid production and oxidative stress on chromosome 21. And this could mean that Down syndrome data sets would actually be a test bed for testing the association, the interaction between amyloid and oxidative stress, for instance. So the interaction between these two different mechanisms. Okay, then we have vasculature. Uh, so we know that cerebrovascular disease is a common copathology in Alzheimer's disease, which can lead to uh, increased cognitive decline or to lower the threshold for developing dementia. Um, we will come to this later, but there is not much around about mechanistic modeling of copathologies. However, there is accumulating evidence that cerebral vasculature and Alzheimer's disease neuropathology interact in multiple ways during the progression of AD. And uh, one of the, one interesting paper that investigated this interaction was proposed by Turia Medina and colleagues in 2015, I think. Yeah, and they, the authors here proposed a multifactorial data-driven analysis for many different biomarkers, including amyloid, metabolism, vasculature, connectivity, and they, got essentially a temporal ordering of progression for those biomarkers. And they found out that vascular dysfunction is an early biomarker for AD progression. And they started, they, they made some speculations about the causal interactions among them, but uh, yeah, anyway, speculations mostly. Um, then in the years, many, many papers added to the collection, uh, investigating the role of cerebral vasculature, like failures in Alzheimer's disease in a data-driven way, let's say. Um, and also studying the mechanisms of vascular uh, failures. Um, but then three years ago, I think a paper, a review paper came out, which again, I believe it could be particularly interesting to read for those who aim at building a biophysical model for uh, um, vascular disruptions in Alzheimer's disease. So in this paper, the author describes both the biophysical side of these cerebrovascular dysfunctions and the more um, biological and genetic side. And from the biophysical side, it's interesting to uh, like read about these types of model that are based on fluid dynamics, essentially, and that uh, describe mechanisms like that the stiffening of central blood vessel could lead to a transmission of an excessive energy uh, through these vessels, through the brain, to the brain, which would cause brain damage and different like physical and biophysical mechanisms are described in the paper, which I think would be interesting to, to have a look at. Okay, then of course we have neuroinflammation. Uh, neuroinflammation is uh, well, caused by glial cells uh, and it's uh, common uh, uh, interaction factors in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there were a few studies in the years that investigated the association between uh, uh, both amyloid and microglial uh, activation and tau pathology and microglial activation. And these, uh, there was this neuropathology study that uh, essentially showed the presence of activated microglia at very low BRAC at, in the brains of people at low BRAC stages somehow suggesting that microglias play a role also in the development, the early development of Alzheimer's disease. And again, there was this a uh, few years later, these genetic studies from Vogels and colleagues uh, where they suggest a pathway for um, interaction between microglias and amyloid uh, 
something along the line that microglia get activated by a pathological trigger, then migrate to a brain lesion, they initiate an immune response, and then they bind to amyloid, which releasing inflammatory substances that somehow accelerate uh, amyloid accumulation. Um, so suggesting ways of describing the interactions between microglia and amyloid deposition. And there was a, another study again, which used, uh, was a neuroimaging based study, which used PET based images of both tau and neuroinflammation to show that the patterns of tau accumulation and neuroinflammation are actually similar, they kind of overlap. So that there is a significant overlap between interaction between microglia and tau pathology. And a lot of interactions among these mechanisms, right? So we've seen there are a lot of interactions, neurodegeneration, selective vulnerability, amyloid and tau, um, like oxidative stress and glucose consumption. So the point is, when it comes down to quantitative modeling, mechanistic modeling, though, there is not much around about modeling the interactions between those uh, different mechanisms. So the interaction, their interaction is important, is significant, but it's also very complex to model. Uh, we will see later though, there are few works on that, but it's really like an open field for, for us. Okay, and then as I promised, I will go a bit more in details of protein dynamics, if you have enough coffee in your cups in front of you. Um, a bit of a schematics, then the most common approach, which is the dynamical system approach, but you heard about dynamical system modeling this morning, so you're familiar with this. Uh, then a bit of a history of mechanistic modeling in, in amyloid, then tau enters the scene later because of that availability, because tau imaging arrives later. And then a bit on amyloid tau interaction, which is a very interesting topic, but it, there's few, like there's not much there yet. This is an interesting review paper on mechanistic modeling of protein dynamics. It's a bit, it's from 2018 though. So it's like the most recent paper are not listed, obviously. Uh, just before discussing any of this, I should just say that uh, there are like two main classes of mathematical models for describing protein dynamics. One is uh, like the family of models that describe molecular level processes. And one is the class of models describing brain level processes. Okay, so while the first one has always been like related to the field of chemical kinetics, while the second one is based on neuroimaging studies and data. And these second types of model had like started just recently to use the most advanced model from chemical kinetics, meaning that these two types of mod, two classes of model used to be a bit you know, parallel and separate. But then in the last year, we've seen that neuroimaging-based you know, studies start using the most advanced chemical kinetics modeling for modeling also molecular level mechanisms and not just brain level mechanisms. Okay. But I will mostly talk about the second part. Okay. So you will see, uh, I will start with a like, very brief schematics on the mechanisms of protein dynamics at brain level. Uh, I will try to convince you that, of course, they're simplifying the molecular level dynamics, but still, I would like to convince you that they can convey the key points of brain dynamics and mechanism, the protein mechanisms. So, uh, the processes of accumulation and clearance of proteins um, are in normal condition are in equilibrium, essentially. So the accumulation is kept in, uh, under, in balance by an efficient clearance, pro clearance process. But this equilibrium under neurodegenerative conditions, uh, this equilibrium is broken and protein started to accumulate and aggregate in plaques, eventually propagating in the brain. And despite the involvement of different proteins in different neurodegenerative disorders, the processes of accumulation, clearance, and propagation are similar, and they are thought to be to involve the structural, the connectome of the brain, the brain connectome, as spatially distant but neuronally connected regions show similar patterns of protein uh, um, abnormalities. So the mechanisms governing all of these are still unclear, but mathematically, we can investigate them using dynamical systems where 
essentially. The functional H encodes the processes of accumulation, clearance, and propagation on the brain connectome. And the temporal evolution of the proteins, Y, are obtained by integrating the dynamical system over time, okay? So the first of these types of model was due to Villemagne. We heard about it already today. Um, the idea is that uh, the dynamics, uh, the protein dynamics is estimated as linear rates of change and the temporal evolution of the biomarkers is obtained by integrating a polynomial function that fits the data against its rates of change. This model deals naturally with correlated measures as we heard uh, already today, but it doesn't really enforce an explicit relationship between biomarkers. And then an evolution, if we can say so, of these types of model uh, arrived in 2012 by uh, Ashish Raj and colleagues. Uh, they um, developed the, um, like a dynamical system for multivariate biomarkers interaction, where the, uh, the interactions between biomarkers are uh, thought to be uh, linear. So these models enforces a constant propagation of proteins amongst brain regions. And this would eventually produce indefinite accumulation of proteins over time. Um, this is, we have here like a, a constant matrix which encodes these types of, of mechanisms. So constant propagation parameter throughout the brain for indefinite accumulation over time. Um, so these, these types of model allows in, in inference. So given an initial condition and a prescribed propagation parameter, you can predict the temporal evolution of um, amyloid uh, propagation, and you can match it against the data to do inference. But the point, the problem with these types of modeling is that we know, we heard today that the actual study time that we have in the data for neurodegenerative diseases data is not the disease time, is the arbitrary study time. So these types of inference, when you match the prediction against the data is biased because your data are in a timeline that is not the disease time, right? Okay, then in 2014, an evolution of these types of model came out by Curia Medina. Um, it's the epidemic spreading model. Uh, so the idea here is that you, you use a more, uh, reason, more uh, yeah, like a different functional in which you account for um, concentration dependent parameters, essentially. So this model can model um, more realistic patterns of amyloid propagation, which do not um, indefinite accumulate over time. And then 2018, another evolution of this model by Weichenmeier and colleagues, applied voxel-wise instead of uh, region-wise as before. This is a reaction diffusion equation. So the idea is that we have a diffusion term here, again, linear, and then we have a reaction term. It's simplified, of course, huh? but the reaction term works as a kind of like deceleration factor. So this protein accumulates over time, but then they reach a certain threshold, which needs to be estimated by the model and they slow down, they go to plateau, which is kind of more realistic because the brain doesn't accumulate amyloid indefinitely over time. Very interesting model, applied voxel-wise. Still in the paper, there was no inference scheme proposed, no real data validation, and the paper uh, doesn't provide any of these types of um, yeah, inference techniques. Uh, Another evolution from last year from Bersh and colleagues, the interesting paper that uses popular population based equation based on this Smoluchowski kernel. So the idea he, here is that these types of population based equation, they can model the uh, evolution of large number of particles within a population, which can grow in number and they can aggregate, right? And this like kind of models the behavior of amyloid at mi micro scale, micro scale. So the idea here is that the model is not applied to voxel or region or regions, but these uh, representative elementary volumes, these REV, uh, which are 
volumes that can vary from micrometers to centimeters, from short scale to long scale. And the idea is that the model naturally adapts to the scale of the problem. So if the aggregate, so the model, the model can model both, uh, you know, monomer aggregation at mi micro scale, and then amyloid propagation at longer scale. Okay, that's the idea of the model. This is the bit that relates to um, propagation. It's spatial propagation, no connectome here, just spatial propagation of amyloid in the brain. And this bit here is the one that relates to accumulation, production, and aggregation. Uh, again, no inference scheme is proposed and no real data validation. Also, the set of simulations is very simple in this paper, but still like, can produce patterns of accumulation, clearance, and propagation that are quite interesting. Um, and then, of course, uh, otherwise, why I would, would be here if I hadn't <laughs> worked a bit on that too. Um, I work, I worked a bit on that as well. So in the last years, we developed a framework for modeling and inference of long-term protein dynamics across brain networks from short-term um, imaging data. And the idea here is that we incorporated uh, disease progression modeling into the game. So we added a disease progression model to the mechanistic model bit in a framework, which is a Bayesian framework, which can provide uncertainty estimation, which allows for model selection of the dynamical system because it's a Bayesian framework. So it's, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, um, we proposed these, uh, this framework as well. We applied it on uh, amyloid data from ADNI. And since the model, like the framework comes with a model selection uh, criterion, we also tried it with three different types of uh, uh, propagation models, propagation like mechanistic models. One that was the linear propagation model from Raj. Then we tried the reaction diffusion model for Weikenmayer and then another third more complex model for accumulation, clearance and propagation. And then I'm aware this will come a bit of a like conflict of interest, but <laughs> I will add a couple of slides on this, mainly because I think, uh, you know, yeah, it's a bit of a conflict of interest, but um, I think it's one of the first uh, model that actually combines disease progression modeling and mechanistic modeling. Um, so I think it would be interesting to know a bit more about this one. And the idea is indeed that we uh, wanted to combine mechanistic modeling of protein dynamics and disease progression modeling. So on one how to do that, so we, we did that. So on one side, we had a disease progression model, like a, continu a longitudinal uh, continuous disease progression model from the classification that we made earlier. So thought of uh, it as a, like a regression model with some temporal uh, reparameterization. And so on the other hand, we have a mechanistic model where essentially you model the evolution of protein dynamics over time as a dynamical system. And so to combine those two models, we built a constrained regression framework for Gaussian, processes reg for Gaussian process regression uh, with constraints on their dynamics. So I'm not going into details of the model, happy to discuss about it though, if you are willing to hear, but uh, the idea is that you um, solve this regression problem where your, uh, your long-term, your, your unknown long-term protein dynamics is, is expressed as a Gaussian process and you constrain its evolution by adding some constraints on their dynamics using a gradient matching approach essentially, okay? So in the first step, we fit the Gaussian process and then we adjusted it by constraining its dynamic uh, on this um, dynamical system, which had unknown parameters. So we had some parameters that were you know, related to accumulation, clearance and propagation dynamics, and we wanted to estimate that as well. So that's essentially what the model does. So the model takes as an input short-term longitudinal data, and returns these things. So it gives you back uh, the reconstructed progression of the protein dynamics over a reparameterized time, plus some 
propagation, accumulation, clearance, dynamics parameters that you have in uh, like that are derived from derived from the type of this dynamical system that you have imposed. So you estimate those parameters as well. So just to give you an idea of what the model produces. Um, so here, just we selected, we, we worked on like parcellation of the brain in 40 regions. So symmetrized left and right brain. Um, and so we, we, we work with this like 42, 41 region of interest in the brain. Now I'm just selecting three of them uh, just for the sake of visualization. The idea is that the model can estimate the protein, the amyloid dynamics of these regions over time, over a reparameterized time. Here, you don't see the uncertainty as associated with every trajectories, but you do that. You do have that as well because it's a Gaussian process regression. So it's a Bayesian regression. So you have uncertainty naturally associated with your parameters. So you have these protein dynamics over time. And together with them, you have, I'm gonna no, they don't hear me anymore if I move. It's okay. They're they already <laughs> gone, you think. <laughs> they are not hearing me already. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, yeah. So the point is that like, uh, so together with the protein concentration evolution, right. Ooh, complicated, huh? So together- You put the screen off on the No, no, but don't worry, don't worry. Uh, so together with this, uh, this um, protein concentration evolution, you get, the uh, parameters of your model, the kinetic parameters of your model. And these types of model, we implemented a model that we called accumulation ACP, accumulation clearance and propagation, which essentially has some um, saturation parameters for or when the, the region saturates and then starts propagating amyloid over the brain. And then you have a plateau threshold, which is region wise, which, is, which happens when each region kind of reaches a plateau and stop uh, accumulating uh, amyloid, right? So we had these different, uh, different um, kinetic parameters and the model estimates them as well. So if you take the, like for instance, the superior frontal region, the blue one, together with the, its evolution, you get a saturation parameter, which happens quite early. So the, apparently the, the, the superior frontal region saturates quite early then, triggers propagation and then propagation goes to plateau eventually. And that's what happens for every, every region. And here on the right, what you see is the propagation parameters. So now highlighted just between these three regions, but again, you see that um, the propagation is stronger and then it goes to plateau again and so on. So you have the kinetic parameters played out over time. And Together with this, what you can do is also personalize dynamics using the vector field theory that you learned about before. So you're familiar with now, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I'm gonna give it for granted, not, not, not joking. But the idea is that you can select a single subject and uh, who has specific baseline values of amyloid concentration. And so it's a dynamical system. So you can you can define, you can find the associated vector field and the vector field describes the, the evolution over time of the specific subject. It's dynamics, it's protein dynamics over time, forward and backward. And here it's, you see the, um, the vector field relative to the, you know, the, the, the evolution, the dynamics evolution of two specific regions, the lingual region and the superior front. And what you can do is like you, you have a subject, you have its baseline values. And so you can play out their dynamics over time by just integrating the dynamical system, right? Given some propagation kinetic parameters that you have estimated and its baseline value. And so this dynamics is the blue one, is the blue line. And in red, you have the associated uncertainty, right? Because it's a Gaussian process based method, it's Bayesian. You have uncertainty associated with the propagation parameters and you can essentially project this uncertainty on the dynamics itself. And here with these green crosses, you see the observed and unobserved follow-ups that we used in the model, just to see whether our prediction was, uh, you know, like they were falling within the prediction of the dynamics of the model. 
And this is between two specific regions, but you can do that between all the regions, right? So for this specific uh, subject, given the uh, you know, dynamic, dynamics predicted by the model, you have the patterns of amyloid accumulation in the brain, right? And yeah, okay. So that was uh, it for mechanistic amyloid dynamics modeling. I'm just gonna go through a bit of a bit more uh, on tau mechanistic modeling and then amyloid and tau interaction very quickly though, because there is less here. Uh, so I will not. Um, yeah, there is less uh, less here. So many studies on tau mechanistic modeling actually still deal with association analysis between uh, patterns of uh, brain connectivity and patterns of tau accumulation. And there are a few studies here, a couple of studies from a couple of groups in Germany that yeah, kind of demonstrate that yes, there is a significant association or actual overlap between brain connectivity networks and tau uh, patterns. So it's, yeah, there is something there. I think particularly interesting is this paper here uh, because they try to validate the results on uh, postmortem brains, which is not very common. So I think it's an interesting paper. And yes, there is a, I think a couple more models for tau kinetics modeling. Uh, one is the paper from Vogel and colleagues uh, where they use this uh, epidemic spreading model which we've seen already from Ituria Medina, but with tau pet uh, data, they tested varying seeding regions, varying connectomes. It's a very interesting um, paper uh, with a lot of uh, in-depth results and discussion. And then there's a more recent paper uh, from Raj and colleagues again, which uses the same population balance equation we have seen before from uh, uh, the group uh, from Bersh and colleagues. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar equation. I would say that, I mean, from my understanding, the main difference is that instead of using spatial uh, diffusion, they implemented a connectome based diffusion, but then the considerations are very similar. Although here the equation is applied at the regional level. So all this point of being micro and macro scale, it's not um, like enforced here. Uh, so that's mostly well, for my reckoning of what's around for tau modeling. And then for amyloid and tau interaction, uh, I would say there is not much of the significance around, maybe I'm wrong and you will like, uh, you have published so much on that. Uh, but yeah, there is not much around for amyloid and tau dynamical system mechanistic interaction. Uh, so the, I think the, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a topic of interest. Uh, over the past years, many, many, many papers came out investigating the synergy, this pas de deux between amyloid and tau. I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic. We heard about it already today. There's a, you know, the, the old view which viewed amyloid Sorry for the uh, for the typo. As a as a trigger, as merely a trigger, like leading a pathological cascade that will eventually uh, then like lead to tau misfolding, spreading, atrophy, cognitive decline. And then there is this kind of new view in which uh, we believe that they may have synergistic beha behavior. They might enforce each other spreading and production. Uh, and there is some interesting, uh, I think this, this review here from 2020 is very interesting. Uh, they discuss many of these possible different mechanisms. Um, they also investigate the possible role of microglia as, uh, you know, connection point, trade union between amyloid and, and, and tau. Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, we already heard about the fact that this interaction could be one of the reasons behind the failure of amyloid uh, trial, uh, or maybe one of the reasons also why, like trials targeting only tau, maybe are not the way to go. Uh, but yeah, so for the mechanistic interaction, as I was saying, there's not much around for dynamical system approach. There is though this paper from this year that which appeared in Neuron this year, if I'm correct, from Seeley's lab again, from Lee and colleagues, uh, which 
essentially uses a combination of cross-sectional imaging and network connectivity analysis to investigate the interactions between amyloid and tau. And they identified, I'm not going into details of this one, uh, but they essentially identified two main amyloid tau interactions, one in the intorhinal cortex, which is an early site for tangles formation and apparently promotes remote interaction between amyloid and tau, so which could be linked to tau spreading in the brain. And one other interactions that they data-drivenly uh, identified is the one in the inferior temporal gyrus, which appear to be both a propagation hub for tau and a region that promotes local interaction of amyloid and tau, okay? Uh, so the, the paper is very interesting, very complex, like different types of modeling techniques that combine imaging and um, connectivity analysis, but I really suggest it if you're interested in uh, modeling the combination and interaction of amyloid and tau. Okay, uh, recap of what we've seen today. Um, so we've seen mechanistic modeling as a way of building tractable models of the mechanisms leading to the development and escalation of neurodegenerative disorders with the aim of enhancing our understanding of the disorders of making treatment prediction via simulation and for an enhanced prediction staging if combined with disease progression modeling. I'm aware these two last points are more like, you know, a challenge than we're not still quite there yet, but I think could be a way to go. We've seen a number of different mechanisms, a number of you know, results of our understanding on them. And then I try to focus more on models of protein dynamics on Alzheimer's disease. What's still missing here? And what I think could be uh, worth investigating in the next years is, well, interaction between mechanisms. So we've seen there is something between amyloid of like modeling amyloid and tau interaction, but that's kind of it. There is not much around for modeling interactions between glucose dysfunction and amyloid or you know, micro, the microglia's role in the in oxidative stress. So I think that's something that would be worth investigating, like building more quantitative models of mechanistic interactions from the results that are around from the studies of etiology of diseases. And then, Subtyping and mixed pathologies. Uh, again, two topics we heard about earlier. Again, so subtyping, very interesting topic in the past years. Many papers came out about it. Uh, amongst them, one paper from Vogel and colleagues used the, essentially they use the, well, they use sustain to identify different subtypes of uh, tau pathology. And then they use the epidemic spread, spreading model a posteriori on these uh, sub sustain identified um, subtypes, which is a very interesting work. Uh, I believe, though, that could be very interesting also to have, you know, mechanistic informed subtypes and not subtypes that are like, you know, mechanistic model on top of a, a posteriori on a subtyping model. And the same for mixed pathologies, they're not. Uh, much around mechanistic for mechanistic modeling in co-pathologies. Although there was this, uh, this work from a few years ago that uh, investigating the, you know, the, the frequency of co-pathologies in Alzheimer's disease data by uh, you know, um, post-mortem analysis on their brain. So they, they examined few brains, but still they found that there was a significant number of co-pathologies, like 60 or 70% of the, the subject analyzed had co-pathologies, mostly Lewy body and alpha synuclein. And the point is that these types of pathology are not silent, right? So their mechanisms interact with Alzheimer's disease mechanisms as well. So that's another point that should be taken into account. Then of course we have a validation problem, either multi-study like this paper here that uh, I think does a multi-study validation on the EBM and the DDEBM. Uh, so that could be something to think about for these types of mechanistic modeling, multi-study validation, or maybe clinical validation, if it's even possible actually for these types of model doing a clinical validation, yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, so we'd be happy to hear your thoughts about that. And then of course, there are statistical limitations that should be mentioned and above all identifiability. 
So identifiability is a topic here, is an issue because these models, they have a huge number of parameters that need to be estimated. And if you want to integrate subtyping, co-pathologies, mechanistic interaction, the number of parameters just explode. And so you can take some precautions, like you can use a Bayesian framework. You, have, you can have some uncertainty associated with your parameter estimation. You can go towards the validation on independent data sets, but still like formally um, identifiability is an issue here for these types of model. Uh, yeah, so I finished, I thank you all. And I just leave you the, uh, if you're interested, the main uh, you know, bibliography that I studied <laughs> in the last <laughs> weeks. Mm -hmm. to have um yeah to give you these results uh, okay thank you Thanks. thanks so much Zara. That thanks great work uh, lots to think about questions Bruno. thank you um okay so uh yeah uh, later up is uh, and, uh yeah thanks um, right okay um um, so, okay, I have a, a okay. question here, but uh, are you sure it's needed, so in the model, to actually use inside the disease population, so inside the disease, and uh, maybe you can do that? Yeah, right? yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point, like after you were talking about okay. today. Um, yeah, I think, though, that for like given the types of mechanistic interact, I mean, we could do it out. I think if we add, for instance, the initial point as an unknown of the model, you know, because I think you kind of, I mean, if I, if I got it kind of correctly from your talk today, the point is that you can, you can get away with the, with estimating a new disease time by, um, having the initial, the subject wise initial point as an unknown of the model. Yeah. And this kind of like replaces the, you know, the time reparameterization thing because you, you, you just shift the initial point of the subjects, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, if my understanding is correct. So, so in our model, we, we didn't use that. We didn't think of that. So we have, you know, the initial, the initial points for every subject is given is their baseline value of a vamiloid. And then we use the time parameterization shift to shift the model across this, 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 this disease time. Uh, so yeah, I think we could probably, you know, avoid adding the time parameterization term and instead keeping the initial point, uh, you know, varying uh, and that could uh, work as well. I agree with you. Um, yeah, uh, but I think somehow in one way or another, you kind of need to move the subjects around the time axis. Uh, yeah. No, it worked, it worked. Please. You mentioned identifiability. Yeah. And then you also presented a dynamic systems model, including accumulation, clearance, and production. Yeah. Isn't, aren't some of those just, you know, additive? How, how do you identify a clear incentive production and accumulation to when it's all just results in a number at yeah. the end? So, so the model is not identifiable. <laughs> that's that's the short answer. Like the model we implemented for the accumulation, clearance, and propagation, we couldn't really demonstrate its its identifiability, like mathematically or formally, because in that case you have you know uh, all these parameters that are region wise. So every region has a number of, each region has a number of param parameters for accumulation, clearance, propagation. Then you have the temporary alignment terms, subject-wise, and then you have to estimate the, the, the Gaussian process curves, right? So it's a lot of parameters. So we couldn't really demonstrate the identifiability. Maybe it was our fault that we couldn't really prove it. Um, what we did was an extensive set of simulations using you know like uh, leave out uh, follow up for prediction and also the fact that we try to use this bayesian framework i believe could be a way to you know like you know you have an uncertainty associated with your estimates so that gives you a bit of more reliability on your estimates but still yeah the model yeah for my understanding for my feeling I need, to, I need to read that paper on the multi-scale approach yeah because some of those parameters you can't even measure yeah, yeah, let, let alone yeah, model. yeah, 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 I agree. Question.
first in Beijing is the first place where I have a position of actually giving feedback to the government. Yeah, so uh, um, should I repeat that or you are the board? No, I think, yeah. So Alex, Alex has asked if uh, we could add uh, other types of data to the model or uh, yeah, pre-computed uh, kind of parameters there. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. It's a good idea uh, that could definitely help also with like, identifiability somehow, because if you had some prior, like meaningful prior information on those parameters, that helps definitely. Also like in, in the model we implemented, for instance, we implemented a sparsity constraint as well to reduce a bit the number of parameters that needed to be identified, estimated. Uh, but of course, if you have some biological priors on the parameters to be estimated, that helps uh, a lot. So yeah, I think you could, uh, you could add that. Especially because our uh, ability to measure is very good, like an ability to model the war or ability. Uh, in your view, what's the best way of controlling the risk that's exposing you in the first place while still adding your all sorts of biological factors? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a uh, I don't know if you heard about it. Well, it's probably in the chat. Presumably. No, yes, so it's in the chat. It. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a it's a it's a very good point. It's a very good uh, good question. Um, I think. Probably that's one of the reasons why there are, there's not much about the dynamical system modeling of mechanistic interactions because it's a complicated topic. Because, uh, yeah, the the, the noise uh, the noise level uh, is is very high, so you can't really measure some of these uh, parameters. So let alone estimate them. Um, I think probably like adding other types of data, for instance, not just imaging based data to get information of these parameters, maybe going at a different scale, uh, measuring proteinomics data, or I don't know, something at a different scale than images that could help. But yeah, uh, it's, it's a good point. I honestly don't have an answer on that. Sure. No. So they asked me about uh, um, the existence of, of clinical validation studies of these types of mechanistic models. And to my knowledge, the answer is no, there's not. Uh, So uh, animal models validations for like these types of quantitative mechanistic disease progression modeling, more like dynamical system related, not really, but there is much more about, you know, validating more speculative uh, uh, mechanistic models that are not quantitatively statistically implemented as well. And th those types of model have more, uh, you know, results on validation on animal models and and so on but there is not uh, there's still yet anything there for these types of quantitative mechanistic modeling with quantitative mechanistic modeling i mean you know statistically from you can you can do inference and you can do make predictions from from a statistical point of view those types of models are not clinically validated are not validated for animal models to my knowledge but the types of models that these types of statistical models stem from, they have validations on animal models often. So some of the studies I showed, um, they have some clinical validations for the models they suggest. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm trying to think about my difference in modeling mechanisms and mechanistic modeling. Okay. So yeah. these, these factors are clearly mechanistic and relevant. Mm -hmm. But I wonder to what degree we're measuring associations between these and animal quality values, and particularly as we've highlighted the potential for interactions. I wonder to what degree are we are we measuring associations between these two parameters rather than? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
yeah, that, that's a good point as well. Um, I think like, for instance, take these types of dynamical system approaches, right? There you enforce an, inter an interaction dynamics between the biomarkers. So you essentially enforce the data. I mean, you, you ask the data whether they follow these dynamics that you are suggesting. So you suggest that amyloid and tau, there is an interaction like amyloid triggers tau, okay? And you build this type of equation. It's, it's a dynamical system. And for this equation, you have parameters, and then you try to estimate the parameters, and you ask you ask the the model to like the data to like the model to fit the data, and you have like an and you read how much you are wrong in the description of the model somehow. You measure some measures of fit, right, and that tells you how much. I mean, a bit of a simplistic way, but that tells you how much your model can explain the data. And then what you can do, for instance, like if you have, a, you know, a, a, for instance, a Bayesian framework, again, you have a model selection inside. So a way to do model selection on the dynamical system. This means that you could try, in principle, different dynamical systems that describe via specific equations the interactions between amyloid and tau. And then you test all the different models against the data and you see which one responds better. Okay, so from this to saying that it's like a demonstration of causal uh, events, uh, I wouldn't go there, yes, not. But it's different than just estimating correlations among them. Like when you, if you don't enforce any biological driven or hypothesis driven interaction and you just want to see whether there's a correlation, that tells you that there's a correlation. So if you don't have a dynamical system, but you just have, you know, a function that describes the interactions amongst them, and you see that yeah, there is an interaction. These types of dynamical system model, they want to go to the way of like saying which kind of interaction is there. So yeah, that's the idea behind it. Um, on the practical side, uh, given that it's very hard to measure all these kind of things, validation is very, you know, uh, far from, and uh, it's uh, complicated to say whether they're actually doing, like measuring any causal uh, interactions. But the idea would be this one. Yeah, that means, of course. Uh, the one from, from Danny. Danny. Uh, so I guess same similar question. We started by talking about this um, microscopic mm. uh, mechanisms and I don't think it's yeah I don't think it's close I don't think they're they're not sufficient to explain what's happening at brain level uh, I think they are something to take into account to describe what's happening at brain level but there's I mean as we heard today there's so much going on as well genetic environmental factors uh, so it's it's uh, clearly uh, yeah still uh, I think could add you know a bit in our understanding of how these kind of mechanisms manifest at brain level I think it would be interesting you know to to keep uh, you know building from these types of model uh, and adding them to our knowledge but yeah it's uh it's a long way to go. I mean, mechanistic modeling, I really like it. Uh, I really do because, you know, this dynamical system world, I really enjoy doing maths on that. I'm aware that it's, it has a long way to go before being, you know, validated, clinically useful and so on. Um, but yeah. Uh, have you seen some uh, actual second order models? Model 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't. I don't think I have. Uh, I don't think I have because also this, uh, you know, population balance equation, this Molochowski equation, it's like a pseudo like differential integral equation. So it combines differential equation and integral equations, but still I think it's first order. I haven't seen anything on second order derivatives. So yeah, no. Five points per individual you need inside <laughs> the second Yeah, three, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, fair enough. Okay. Um, okay. Any more questions? So one last question. It's a curveball question. So this you mentioned a few times interactions. Yeah. Very important and difficult to model. Um, as a mathematician, how much of that our limits here, do you think, are based on the limits of the mathematical tools that we have? Because multi three body problems, yeah. physics are very, very difficult. To yeah. solve. Uh, how much yeah. are we going to be limited by the mathematical framework that we have? And how much do you think that we need to start interacting with people that are perhaps thinking of other approaches to modeling complex systems? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's it's 50 50. 50 like types of data, um, like types of data we have. So how far can we go into details if the data we have, it's just images, which has a fixed resolution. So what's the point of going into microscopic scale if we can just measure images? We need microstructural imaging techniques, for instance, or modeling to go there. So on one side, I think we have, you know, the types of data we have that that limits the way we can model interactions. But on the other side, we do have uh, to think about different ways of modeling these, uh, these interactions from a mathematical point of view. So going toward more, you know, stochastic, uh, probably, or, you know, chaotic uh, behaviors. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an important point as well to think about that also mathematically, uh, we could we might need to develop different, you know, techniques for modeling these types of model. I found interesting this population balance equation because it was the first time these types of you know mm, equations that are typically used in mm, gas interactions or like you know population equation, nothing to do with protein dynamics, but was used and was like interesting use and had like interesting res interesting results. But, so the small yeah, the small Chosky yeah, yeah. an aggregation equation. It's an aggregation equation. It's a production aggregation equation in this case. Yeah, it has a production term and an aggregation term. And then they add the, the propagation term. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, thanks again to Thank Sarah you. for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.